In 30 years, I will make sure there's no more fossil fuels. In 30 years, I want to be a mentor to those who have been in my shoes. I have a hot feeling that hover cars are going to be a thing in 30 years. In 30 years, I will have bought my family their dream houses for helping me when I was young. Thank you all for attending today's event celebrating 30 years of charter public schools in California and to honor the life and legacy of late Senator Gary K. Hart, who authored the Charter Schools Act of 1992. Today's event will take a look at the ways charter public schools have reimagined public education in California and across the nation. The success of the charter movement today rests on the parents and educators who have put so much into providing charter public school opportunities to communities across the state. We would not be here without their efforts. Thank you so much. I also want to thank the students who have taken advantage of the opportunities provided by their charter schools in our shining example of the strength of California's public education system. Now, the Charter Schools Act was signed into law in 1992, paving the way for new educational options for parents. Charter innovation and flexibility have forever transformed and improved the public education landscape. The first charter public school in California, San Carlos Charter Learning Center, opened its doors to students in 1994 and continues to operate today. San Carlos has provided a high quality education to thousands upon thousands of students across the Bay Area. And it is just hard to imagine how much growth California's public charter school students have seen over these three decades, serving millions of students over the past 30 years. But today, California has more than 1,300 charter public schools serving about 700,000 students. Charter public schools have a long track record of getting better academic results for Black and Latino students across our state and are helping to close the achievement gap year after year after year. And thanks to a college-going culture, charter public schools are expanding access to higher education for those Latino and Black students across our state, in fact, bending the trend line for first-generation access for college students. Charter schools are built upon foundational guiding principles of equity and inclusion and innovation. They are open to all and serve students from every background. No child can be excluded from attending a charter public school because of their background or academic achievement or the zip code where they live. These community driven schools are created by educators who have the flexibility to design instructional models that put students first and deliver a high quality education. The great part about charter public schools is the ability to personalize a learning program for every student at every level. And we have seen an explosion in educational offerings since the advent of charter public schools 30 years ago. But I can't wait to see what's in store for the future as new technology and a greater understanding of students' development uh, and academic needs provides new opportunities to better serve students in the way that fits them. So that is what our celebration is about today. And to start off our program, I want to introduce our very first guest, my good friend Nina Reese, who is the president and CEO of the National Alliance for Charter Public Schools. Hi, Nina. Hi, Mirna. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us in this celebration in the midst of all your travels. Um, My pleasure. How has California influenced the charter movement nationally? What role does California play and in what ways is that manifested over the last 30 years? Mm -hmm. California is the second state that passed the charter school law. Uh, and in many ways, it has been 
uh, at the forefront of setting the trend for charter schooling throughout the nation. Uh, in terms of innovations, some of our most innovative charter school management organizations are from California. Uh, what's also fascinating to me is that you have been able to grow despite the fact that the per pupil allocation mm -hmm. following students to charter schools is far less than the per pupil allocation in states like Massachusetts and New York City and this, the states in the Northeast that usually boast high academ academic achievement. The other thing that's great about California is the diversity of its charter school sector. Uh, you have them all over uh, the state. Uh, and in terms of growth numbers, um, you know, even to this day, California is the state that's growing in terms of numbers. It is a big state, of course, but uh, the growth projections coming out of California, Florida, and Texas usually set the trend for the rest of the country. So uh, we pay a lot of attention to California for all of those reasons. Uh, there is a history here. There is a movement that has been brewing for quite some time. Um, and, you know, we... Uh, feel very confident that regardless of the barriers thrown your way because of the size of your sector, because of the number of students, families in the sector, that you'll be able to withstand the test of time and come out stronger and continue to grow and demonstrate what it's like to cre create a great medium in which high quality public schools can grow. Appreciate that. Now, Nina, we are living through a really odd moment. Um, uh, it, it's being felt in different ways across the, 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 the nation um, as, as we're navigating this pandemic in somewhat different ways uh, across the different states. Um, but in this moment, what do you see as opportunities for charter public schools today that we should be paying attention to? That's a great question. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, anyone who's in the education field, uh, you know, hats off to them. I mean, they have gone through so much and they're under so much scrutiny. Um, you know, I can't even imagine they're in every job that, you know, has existed. There's a lot of stress right now because of the uncertainties that the pandemic brought. But I think in education, that stress has been even more, which is why we see so many teachers and principal principals leave the field. Uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned, as you well know, the charter school sector uh, showed up really well uh, in light of the pandemic. There was a study out of uh, Stanford University's Credo that demonstrated that our leaders were able to make adjustments within three days of the pandemic hitting, whereas traditional districts, unfortunately, took them quite some time to understand the dynamics at play and how to make sure they were offering remote learning uh, in a way that was equitable and and you know productive for the students they were serving, um, and then through the pandemic last school year, we also saw a huge surge in enrollment in charter schools in every single state that has a charter school law. And that's largely because our schools were responsive to the needs of families. And if one was available in their neighborhood, chances are that you were probably opting to send your child to that school as opposed to a school that was you know, closed for too long or was not offering remote learning um, you know, in an efficient way or was not respond responsive to the different needs of working families. And so uh, I think it's a really interesting time in public education in the sense that we are, uh, for the first time, a lot of families who are not usually attending or sending their kids to charter schools were exposed to some of the deficiencies in our traditional system. Unfortunately, a lot of individuals also voted with their feet to send their kids to pods and micro schools and private settings. We're proud to say that the charter school sector attracted 240,000 students and those students ended up staying in the public school system. So there's a lot more to be done. I think right now learning loss is front and center for every single you know, school out there and so how well we do in terms of closing those gaps and um, addressing the different needs of our families is going to determine our success down the road. But it's definitely a moment um, where we should be really proud of the fact that the, the, the charter model offered the flexibility and freedom necessary for principals to make quick course corrections. And then there's something about the DNA of our leaders uh, that made them you know, capable of making these corrections fast instead of waiting for someone to tell them how to do this. 
I couldn't agree more. And I think that that piece of DNA that that you're you're pointing to is uh, just the the relentless focus on putting students first and asking first and foremost that question: How is it going to serve students better? Is it responsive? Is it adequate? Is it sufficient? Is it urgent enough? And I join you in uh, being incredibly proud of our public charter school staff and teachers uh, and principals and leaders who've uh, really really. Uh, uh, distinguish themselves in, in this moment. Um, and yet, you know, I, I think it does call um, into very bold relief, like the questions that we should be asking. Um, we know that going back to the pre-March 2020 days uh, is probably not possible, and, and, and I hope not advisable as well, because we've learned a lot about how to adapt, how to respond, certainly the use of technology uh, and the power of innovation to be responsive to changing, um, uh, changing needs, uh, changing, uh, uh, making it the, 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 the issues of equity more visible uh, is something that we absolutely should be uh, taking a, a very close look at as we think about how do we come out of this hole that the last uh, two years of a global pandemic have, uh, has put us all in. So I'd love to hear your reflections. What's next? What about the next 30 years? What will ensure that we are here to maybe not you and me, but here <laughs> as a movement uh, in, 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 in to celebrate the 60th anniversary of charter public schools? What do you envision are the key levers that are going to get us there? Well, you know, you have a, a student who's going to speak in a minute. I think the question would be a good one to ask her. And right after being around for 30 years, we now have alumni who have graduated from uh, charter schools. I dedicated our weekly brief introduction this week because we, we have a couple of programs we've launched uh, to attract uh, interns to our uh, rising leaders program and th this program called change makers I think more than anything we need to make sure we're giving voice um, and allowing these individuals to come into our sector and do the work that we are doing because ultimately this is their movement when we were starting off um, you know most of us this was a theory really that yeah. was being discussed and uh, our leaders were at the helm but now we have people who have benefited from charter schools and stand to be the best people to describe what's next. Um, I think one of the things that the pandemic did and which you mentioned is uh, introduce kind of this notion that education can happen anytime, anywhere, and doesn't have to happen within the four corners of a classroom. I hope that that continues because when you think about the future and how well our students, I have a 16 year old, you have a child too, you know, they're on their phone all the time. So how much can we leverage that technology both to make sure we're giving them a good education that meets them where they are and grows them and make sure they're learning at, without harming their mental health. So Absolutely. I think there's just a lot in there. And then the other thing you mentioned is college readiness. I think the mm -hmm. track record of charter schools in terms of preparing students for college and life has been stellar. I think that's going to continue to be one of the things that distinguishes us and gives people hope uh, that if you put your child in a charter school, they're going to get a education that fits their needs. But in order for us to really turn this corner well, we have to continue uh, both um, sharing what we've learned with the traditional system, but also making sure that those who are benefiting from charter schools are front and center and talking about this and uh, leading the sector into the future. So well said, voice, urgency, hope, and of course, the central primacy of relationships. Nina Reese, President and CEO of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Goodbye. As we talk about the past 30 years, it is really important to acknowledge that California was not the first state in the nation to enact a charter school law. In fact, it was Minnesota that passed the first public school choice chartering law in 1991, effectively creating a new sector in public education. Now, the author of that legislation was Minnesota State Senator Ember Reichgott Young. Today, she leads the National Charter School Founders Library Initiative. And while she could not join us in person today, she was kind enough to provide us with this thoughtful video mes message. Take a look. Hello, California. I'm former Minnesota State Senator Ember Reichgott Young, and I am delighted to congratulate all of you 
on 30 years of reimagining public education. We're the only two states that can celebrate 30 years of bringing new and different opportunities to our families through chartering. When I authored the first charter school bill in Minnesota in 1991, I was devastated. I thought that it was so compromised, there would never ever be a charter school. And I certainly never expected chartering to go beyond the state of Minnesota because Minnesota was always considered an outlier state in public school choice. But I didn't know then that two Minnesotans were talking to Senator Gary Hart and they were Ted Coldery and Eric Premack. Gary Hart made all the difference for spreading chartering nationally. He is the reason why chartering is in 45 states. When his charter school bill passed in California, that was a big deal. And that happened only because Gary was an extraordinary legislator who took an extraordinary stand for change. I had the privilege of interviewing Senator Gary Hart in an oral history for California for the National Charter National Schools, Charter Founders, Schools Library. Founders Library. And he told us then that there were two bills. There was the House bill, and then there was his bill. They were competing bills, but Gary's bill was the original Minnesota bill before those compromises. The House bill had been shaped by the teachers union. So the lawmakers agreed on a deal that both bills would go through the process on their own, and they'd meet in conference committee and work it out there. But that was not to be, because Speaker Willie Brown stepped in and directed that the House bill pass unamended to the governor. And it did. And Gary was not happy with that. The deal was broken. So he was a brilliant strategist. And he designed what he called legislative jujitsu to finesse the process and send his unamended bill to the governor as well. His brilliance took everybody by surprise. And lobbyists could only drop business cards from the balcony with the word no on it to try to stop it. And off the bill went to the governor. Well, Governor Pete Wilson, who was a friend of Minnesota U.S. Senator Dave Dernberger, signed Gary's bill and vetoed the House bill. That was the first charter school law that passed in its original form without compromise. That was another big deal. But Gary wasn't done. He met with Governor Roy Romer of Colorado and my friend, Representative Peggy Kearns. And that state passed chartering in the next year. I've always thought of both Gary and Peggy, both of whom have passed on now, as my sole siblings. We were three Democratic lawmakers committed to making chartering a reality, despite the fact that our union colleagues opposed it. We sometimes forget that Democratic lawmakers and governors, including Roy Romer and President Bill Clinton, led the way for chartering and that it has always been a bipartisan policy. And that's what has sustained chartering for 30 years. Thank you for having me and congratulations again on 30 years of public charter schools. Cheers to the next 30. And now I yield to my friend and my fellow lawmaker. Senator Gary Hart, in his own words. The idea of a charter was so unique and, and difficult to sort of wrap one's arms around. Um, I wasn't sure that this was an idea that would fly and that in fact, it might even be an embarrassment. So one of the questions that I asked, is there any place else in the world where this has been um, even introduced? And I found that Minnesota not only had introduced it, but had passed um, a charter law. And Minnesota to me was not Mississippi. Minnesota was a progressive state that I had always admired. And so that gave me um, some courage to want to move forward with um, a charter bill here in California. That was beautiful in such an apt remembrance of Senator Hart and his legacy. Now to dive deeper into the original intent of charter legislation and reflect on how charters have grown over the past 30 years, I'm so excited to welcome Sue Burr and Eric Premack. 
Both Sue and Eric were instrumental in helping Senator Hart as the original legislation was developed and enacted in 1992. Indeed, Eric played an instrumental role in drafting and architecting charter laws in two dozen states, while Sue has been recognized as one of the founding mothers of California's charter movement. Now, since that time, their careers have been dedicated to education and education policy to better serve California's children. I'm so honored to welcome you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Marina. Great to be here. Thank you. Now, you both work very closely with Senator Hart. How would you describe him? Sue, let's start with you. Uh, I guess the two words that come to mind whenever I think about Gary are integrity and empathy. He, had, he knew his core principles and he always stuck by them. Um, he was an incredibly and intellectually curious person. Um, and as you can probably witness by his legacy, he had a deep and abiding passion for public education. Um, he was a product of public education um, in K through 12. He went to school in Santa Monica. And then once he finished his graduate work, he became a teacher, which I think uh, as the mother of a teacher is the ultimate testament to the commitment to public education. Um, I think it's also important to know about Gary that he had a very storied legislative career before charter schools. Many of you may know this, uh, going back to 1983 when he passed a landmark reform bill known as Senate Bill 813, which not only pumped um, hundreds of millions of dollars into the public education system at a time when it was badly needed, increased the uh, number of days in the school year, the number of hours. Uh, he increased beginning teacher salaries. He made it easier to get rid of teachers, honestly, who were not um, suited for the profession. It was just a very wide ranging bill. And then he also passed a law that was called sc about school restructuring, which was really the precursor um, to the charter school law, which was small in scope, but it gave educators the opportunity to, re using your word, to reimagine what public education could look like. So um, he was a dear, dear friend of mine, and it was it's a very deep loss. It most certainly is. Um, uh, Senator Hart was so courageous, as have been uh, the two of you. Uh, Eric, share some thoughts about Senator Hart. Um, when Sue mentioned uh, those concepts, I the ones that came to mind for me were um, uh, curiosity and humility, um, which you don't always associate with legislators, frankly. Um, and um, he really wanted to know how you know how things worked. And uh, even thirty years, you know, as recently as November, I you know went and chatted with him, and he kept grilling me about, you know, how is the law still playing out decades later? Uh, very, very much interested and active um, long after his retirement as a legislator. Um, he was also very demanding. If you, he really wanted to know what was going on, he uh, pressed uh, his staff and himself and his colleagues very hard to make things work. It sounds like him for sure. Eric, uh, as Ember said in her video message, you modeled California's law in the original legislation from Minnesota, one right after the other. How were you able to use that legislation to craft California's Charter Schools Act? And what, what stood out as similarities or adaptations to the California context? Yeah, the, the actual um, uh, kind of heavy lift, if you will, of drafting it was done by Sue. Uh, <laughs> my role was primarily as a, uh, what I call a sharer of ideas and concepts. I had grown up in Minnesota and was drawn into the charter policy discussions uh, as young as being a, a, a budding policy geek in high school um, by my good friend and policy genius, Ted, Ted Coldry, who yes. had largely put, cooked up the charter concept. And what I learned was that um, from having been a product of the public schools in Minnesota and then working as a legislative staff around education matters in California was that despite the fact that the two states are very different in size, um, both of their education systems were uh, challenged by some common problems, including intense bureaucracy, uh, very difficult labor relations problems, um, problems of scale, and other issues that really made it difficult for schools to innovate and adapt. Uh, and so we focused on a number of key concepts um, things like um, 
uh, you know, innovation in the instructional design, uh, emphasizing the public nature of these schools, uh, emphasizing the professional opportunities for teachers to play a strong role in actually managing and leading schools. Uh, and uh, all of that facilitated by what we call a mega waiver. Yes. And uh, Sue did a brilliant job of, of weaving that into uh, a bill and getting that through the legislative process. And I think the other key things that we brought in from Minnesota were some tactical strategies like presenting a very lean bill that was hard to attack um, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, Sue did just a brilliant job at that. And uh, Senator Hart gave her the running room to do that. I love it. I love it. So let's let's go to Sue. Uh, as you were crafting that legislation, what did you think the outcome was going to be? Did you think that it would go through? What, what were your biggest challenges? Uh, we, we had many. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I think, interestingly, one of the biggest challenges, and I, I, I think Gary may have mentioned this in the video that you saw, um, was that people just didn't understand the concept. It was yeah. so new that, um, you know, the folk, as we heard, Minnesota was the first state. And, and prior to that, there was some re there was some um, documentation, especially by Al Shanker, who was the president of the AFT at the time. Um, talking about this concept of teachers being able to come together and perform and really create a professional practice mm -hmm. like a body of lawyers would do or engineers or accountants um, mm -hmm. since they knew the best uh, about how to best educate children. But it, again, people were kind of unclear on, well, what are you trying to accomplish here? Um, I think the other major challenge was um, not surprisingly breaking through the status quo. People were very concerned about changing what we were doing. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why most of the major interest groups from the teacher unions to the school administrators said, whoa, 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 you know, we don't know if we want to have anything to do with it. Um, so that I think those were the two major things. Um, the, the lack of not the lack of awareness about what it was and kind of conceptually figuring it out um, and the resistance to change. Of course. Of course, <laughs> Eric, the charter public school movement has grown tremendously and it's really evolved in the past 30 years. I think we're I, I, I'm thinking we're at, at like charters 3.0 right now. What are you most proud of seeing happen and evolve in the last 30 years? Well, it, um, it, it is hard to uh, realize that it has been 30 years. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I was pretty young when we started at this. Um, there are kind of two things that I'm really proud of. First off, as a, as a policy nerd, um, it's really fun to be a part of kind of a proof of a fundamental concept that system change is possible within the public education system. Um, and that's a really big deal for a system that really remained largely unchanged for decades prior to the advent of char charter schools and a system that had proven very impervious to change. Mm -hmm. um, second is kind of, if I take my policy nerd hat off and just look at it as a regular human being, it's really exciting to know that, you know, over a third of a million students in California um, every day go to charter schools and that many of them have had their lives immeasurably improved and enriched uh, through that experience and that that it has been going on for years and years and hopefully will continue for decades going forward. That certainly seems right, uh, Eric. Um, it, Sue, I'm going to make a bold statement and say that the, the last 30 years are just the beginning uh, for the charter public school movement. Um, and I am so looking forward to the next 30. But from your experience, deep in the work of California's education system as a whole and being such a, a an amazing and exemplary thought leader and policymaker and um, agitator and imagineer uh, for those many years, where do you think we go next? Well, thank you for your kind words, first of all. Um, I think, you know, it's we have to sort of look at short term and long term. I think short term, and Nina touched on this in her comments, uh, we have a lot of healing that needs to be done within the public education system as a result of this pandemic. 
Um, but I also think there are many lessons that are gonna help us with improvement. Uh, one is that we go, what we try to do with charters and return students to the center of every decision that we make and every improvement that we try to make. Um, I think the pandemic has taught us how important interpersonal relationships are, how important it is to see each other, not, not necessarily through these screens that we're having to work through. Um, but I also hope because, and, and Eric may want to speak to this too, that we see a sense of renewed collaboration. Because what I've seen, and I want to reflect on one of the major intents of charter schools was to be an R and do an R and D, a research and development arm in public education that would create this kind of continuous loop back to the non-charters. Um, if the freedom was going to be given and the flexibility to charters to try all these wonderful things on behalf of students, then we wanted our larger public education system to learn from that. We've lost that in my view. I don't know if we ever had it, but we certainly want to, we, we want to go there. And so I would hope as we move forward, and I have every faith that charters will be around in 30 years, that we, we re return to that notion of a research and development and make sure that charters and non-charter public education work more closely together. I think it will benefit both sectors. That is my most fervent hope as well, Sue. Thank you so much for raising that. And if I can interject my own opinion here, um, I would also aspire uh, for us to um, uh, very much lead the conversation to a return to outcomes again. Um, I feel that we have uh, uh, also sort of uh, in, in general, in, in the policy debates of education, uh, continue to get dragged back into inputs. Um, and uh, we, we're seeing a living example right now as we are uh, nearing the end of the uh, acute uh, pandemic um, uh, phase of COVID-19 into an endemic phase that in the end, those pillars that we bet everything on, flexibility, autonomy, educate, uh, 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 flexibility, innovation, and the kids first mentality has to shape our ability to think about outcomes first. Um, Eric, I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, where, where do we go next in the, in the last three minutes that we have. Yeah, I, I think um, we really need to double down on the innovation theme that Sue raised. And we still have large numbers of students for whom uh, traditional modes of instruction really aren't meeting their needs. Mm -hmm. And I'm fervently hopeful and optimistic that uh, the changes that we've seen during the pandemic have opened people's minds to entirely different forms of schooling. Now, that's not to say that distance learning has worked really well for everybody by a long shot, um, but a, a mind you know, stretched to a new dimension never returns to its original form. And I'm hoping uh, that we're able to capitalize on that as a sector going forward and put the charter sector out front and center in designing new schools to meet the needs of students whose needs traditionally have not been met well uh, within traditional modes of schooling uh, and double down on that theme and then share those understandings with the larger system. Yeah, well said, well said, Eric. Um, and with that, I, I just want to add, it is a tremendous honor and a privilege and a huge responsibility also to be in these leadership positions in this moment, in this time, um, uh, being witness to history and uh, and the, the the tremendous opportunities that we have to really truly take stock and uh, and uh, think very carefully about what a, a, a renewed reimagination uh, could look like, so that we can really truly transform uh, our public education systems in ways that work, especially for those kids for whom the system does not work well. I am so honored to know you both, to call you friends. I want to thank you for your tremendous efforts throughout the years to support the charter movement and for all the things that you will continue to do. Thank you so much, Sue and Eric. Happy 30th. Thank you, Minerna. <laughs> As we turned now from how the movement began and where it is today, it's incredibly important that we look to the future. The future of charter public schools uh, uh, in California and in the nation and the best examples of its success comes in the outcomes in the transformed lives of students. A real shining example of those outcomes, of the stories, of that voice 
is a young woman named Shannon Doss. Let's hear a little bit about her amazing charter story in this video. Take a look. I graduated from UCLA with my bachelor's in sociology and African-American studies. I graduated from USC with my master's in social work. I knew I needed to get the social work degree in order to help people in the way that I wanted to. I work at Da Vinci Rise High School and I am the school social worker. Our aim is to serve foster homeless probation youth, so I link students to resources, I help them get jobs, work permits, and I think my favorite part and what I'm really passionate about is mental health. Being able to be that person for these students, doing therapy with them, but also like just showing them how to build skills of resiliency and things that will help them when they get out of high school. Professionally, I would like to become the manager or director of student support services. I would like to still stay within schools and just support students making policy and making structural change because I see a lot of things that can change within schools to help best support students. And right now, I'm just doing the change, but I want to kind of be the one that implements and um, creates it as well. For me, I think success means making an impact on others. And joining us now is Shannon Doss, who recently joined the Los Angeles Unified School District as a psychiatric social worker, one of the most critical frontline positions today as we navigate our way out of this global pandemic and serve the whole of students uh, in our classrooms and schools today. Hi, Shannon. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great uh, in a celebratory mood. That's for sure. <laughs> awesome. Yes, this is a great occasion. Uh, Shannon, how did your family end up choosing Animo, uh, Green Dot Animo for your education? Um, so it actually wasn't really anything spectacular. Um, my mother and my twin sister and I were riding down the street that our the school was located on, and we saw the marquee that said College Leadership and Life. And that really appealed to my mother as an alternative to um, public schools that she didn't see as having the same values. Um, so yeah, I entered into the lottery, I got in, and when I got there, I really saw the vision for that, um, those statements, college, leadership, and life. That's wonderful. So how do you think your charter education shaped you as a person? How did it prepare you for higher education? Um, I think having the small setting of a charter school provided me with a real individualized education. Um, I was able to build better relationships with teachers and staff. Uh, for example, I remember graduating and coming back to my school counselors, asking them to help me fill out my FAFSA every year, um, and just spending time with teachers as and mentors. It was like I was able to form like a little family um, at the school, and that really helped um, being at a smaller school to have opportunities to form those relationships, to network. And some of those skills paid off in college, um, in higher education. I was able to talk to professors and just have the confidence and form bonds that I think I was um, given those skills early on with the charter school education. Mirna, are you there?
Hi, Shannon. Sorry, we ran into some technical difficulties there. No worries. My name is Jeff Macedo. I'm a Senior Director of Communications for uh, CCSA. So, um, yeah, I'll just, uh, <laughs> if you want to continue where you're, where you're at. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what are you looking to do next with your career? Um, so currently, as a licensed social worker in the schools, I um, am helping the students with mental health. And I think uh, I just kind of want to continue on doing that. Um, like I said in the video, I do aspire to possibly kind of move up in uh, mental health in a school district and be able to impact change from maybe a higher level of support for the students, for the most vulnerable students in schools. Wow. Well, we're all very proud of you and the and the work that you've done uh, for, you know, as a product of of charter schools and and how you're giving back to your community today. Uh, it's Thank it's you. really awesome that you're able to come back. Oh, and Thank here's you. Mirna. So I'll turn it back over. Shannon, the, we are in the age of dropped lines <laughs> and computer crashes. Uh, in oh the yeah. Middle. I apologize, but I'm so glad that we you had a chance to be here with us and tell your story. And I, ca I cannot tell you what an honor it is to meet a charter alumna. Um, Thank you. You are exactly what we dreamed of. And uh, as I think you heard from when, when we're in backstage, I feel like I'm part of Generation 2.0 um, of charter <laughs> leaders and policymakers. And we cannot wait to see the great impact and gift that you are not just to your students, but to the charter movement and to our community as uh, at large. And I'm just so, so proud of you and so happy that you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, as we come to an end uh, of our program today, I uh, want to thank you so much for joining us today. What a beautiful look back uh, to the legacy of Senator Hart and some of our charter founding voices, Eric and Sue, um, as we think about and reflect about the development of California's charter school movement. I'm so excited and so proud of the great accomplishments we've uh, managed to uh, collaborate on and achieve together in the last 30 years. And I'm so excited for what the next 30 years have in store for all of us. Siempre adelante. Congratulations, Charters. Happy 30th. In 30 years, I will make sure there's no more fossil fuels. In 30 years, I want to be a mentor to those who have been in my shoes. I have a hot feeling that hover cars are going to be a thing in 30 years. In 30 years, I will have bought my family their dream houses for helping me when I was young. 